Jr. is confirmed 96 to 0. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table. The President shall be immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate shall resume legislative session. Madam President. Majority Leader. I now ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to pre to morning business. Senators are allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes each during that period of time. There will be no more roll call votes this week. We're going to have some votes Monday night. Everyone should be aware of that. Without objection. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
in what should be their only bit of legislative work today, the U.S. Senate approving the nomination of Max Cogburn to be a U.S. District Judge for the Western District of North Carolina. The vote was 96 to 0. The U.S. House today is debating a, a bill that would eliminate the FHA refinance program. A number of amendments debated today. Amendment votes underway now in the U.S. House and final passage later this afternoon. They will have a similar bill tomorrow that deals with mortgage assist assistance programs and that, uh, that debate tomorrow in the, um, in the U.S. House.
President. Senator from Georgia. Madam President, uh, I rise to acknowledge an anniversary tomorrow. It's a tragic anniversary. Excuse me, we need a, we have a quorum. I would uh, ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Senator from Georgia. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I uh, rise today to acknowledge the second anniversary of a tragic event that happened on March the 11th, 2009, in the nation of Benin in Africa. On that tragic day, a young lady by the name of Kate Pusey was tra tragically murdered in her sleep in her house at night. Kate Pusey was a volunteer from Georgia for the Peace Corps who went to Benin with all the dreams and hopes and aspirations of the program that John Kennedy created over a half a century ago. She had served there for months. She was teaching young African children. She was sharing wisdom. She was sharing knowledge and she was sharing for her love of mankind, and she was representing the United States in the way that the Peace Corps intended it. Unfortunately, her life was lost. Now, I didn't know Kate Pusey before her death. I only know her after her death. But I know her through her parents, through her schoolmates, and through her fellow Peace Corps volunteers in Africa who told me the story of Kate Pusey. And also, tragically, stories of other volunteers to the Peace Corps that have lost their lives or have sacrificed in the service of our country. Uh, tomorrow night at 6.30 on the steps of the Capitol, there will be a candlelight village vigil acknowledging this anniversary of the second year of the death of Kate Pusey. Kate's mother will be here, as well as Peace Corps volunteers, as well as people from the Peace Corps itself. It will be a solemn moment, but it will also be a very sacred moment. Madam President, as the ranking member of the Africa Subcommittee, I have traveled to Africa on a number of occasions, and I have been in a number of African countries. And on each visit I go to, I arrange either a breakfast or a lunch where I host the Peace Corps volunteers from the United States in that country. Without exception, and in every case, these are the finest of Americans. You know, a lot of people don't understand the Peace Corps as much as they should. A lot of people think it's a lot of young, idealistic kids, and we do have a lot of young kids that volunteer their time and go. About just two years ago when I was in Tanzania, I found a couple, 73 and 72 years old, who in their retirement decided they wanted to give back and help their country and serve their mankind. And they volunteered to go to Tanzania and build a library where there wasn't even a library, a book, or a school. And they did it. In, in uh, Kenya, I went and visited with young people who went to Kenya to help carry the message of democracy, help share in the terrible slum of Kibera, the promise and hope of education, of good nutrition, of knowledge, of hard work, and of democracy. We as a country are blessed to have men and women who serve us in many capacities, those who may serve in the House or the Senate here, those that serve in the branches of the military overseas in harm's way, but equal to their service is the service of our Peace Corps volunteers. And Kate Pusey was the example of what those Peace Corps volunteers do at its height. When I attended her funeral, I sat and listened for over two hours to her fellow volunteers, her former classmates from Forsyth High School, tell about the Kate Pusey they knew, the academic genius, the committed volunteer, the person who loved life and loved people and wanted to share that love wherever she could. The volunteers in Benin told of her countless sacrifices to help young people and children in that troubled land and that difficult country understand better their life's future and not look to poverty as a lifetime of shackles, but look to opportunity as a lifetime of hope. So tomorrow night when the, village takes, when the vigil takes place on the steps of the Capitol, I will not be here, unfortunately, but I'll have be saying a special prayer for the life of Kate Pusey, for her family, and for what she and all volunteers who've sacrificed in the Peace Corps have done for the United States of America, and better than that, for mankind. Madam President, we have many great people to be thankful for in this world, but tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. on the steps of the Capitol, there will be a pause to recognize the life, the legacy, and the sacrifice of Kate Pusey. And I will be there in spirit, and I'll be with her in prayer. Madam President, I yield back and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
senator from Hawaii. I suggest the decision of the quorum call. Without objection. Mr. President, Madam President. Senator is recognized. Today the nation faces a very difficult political landscape when it comes to addressing the major challenges to our country, such as unemployment and the deficit. The American public is demanding that the House and Senate work with the President to address these concerns. I believe the American people's understandable and growing concern over the national debt is shared by every member of this body. But in order for the Congress to address our fiscal crisis, we must fix our broken budget process. Today, with fiscal year 2011 nearly halfway, as a result of the Congress's inability to finish its work, the federal government is still operating on stopgap funding designed to avert a government shutdown. And Madam President, this is no way to govern. Continuing resolutions make it difficult for federal agencies to perform their duties. As the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Gates, has stated very clearly, operating under a CR places a great burden on the Department of Defense. The same can be said for every federal agency. Our failure to act responsibly makes the everyday functioning of government more difficult and less responsive to the needs of the American people. Moreover, continuing resolutions make a mockery of our constitutional responsibility to allocate taxpayer funding wisely. Putting the country on budgetary autopilot is simply unacceptable. It is well past the time to cast aside the blistering campaign rhetoric of the fall and find a means to compromise. Madam President, many new members of this body were elected on the promise of a return to fiscal responsibility. I would suggest that returning to regular order in our budget process is a necessary component to achieve this goal. The Appropriations Committee produces 12 individual bipartisan spending bills. But when the Congress fails to act on them through regular order, we wind up with a trillion dollar omnibus bill or a trillion dollar continuing resolution that cedes the power of the purse to the executive branch. Neither the most liberal nor the most conservative member of this body should prefer an omnibus or a CR over the regular order in our budget process. Several weeks ago, I had the opportunity to, to sit down with the new chairman of the House Appropriations Committee to congratulate him on his new position. During our discussion, we both agreed that the Congress needs to reestablish regular order in the appropriations process. Both chambers need to pass its bills and allow us to work out our differences in conference. Madam President, I believe that if we adopt this approach, we can do our part to help this nation regain its economic health. The first step in the process is the adoption of a budget to provide the framework for appropriations bills. The House must step up to the plate with a budget that is workable. It cannot hide behind vague rhetoric and arbitrary spending, spending caps. It should not insist upon irrational programmatic cuts that would devastate the everyday lives of American people. Likewise, it is imperative that the Senate do its part in moving a budget through a responsible and regular order process, including the timely adoption of a budget resolution. If a budget resolution is not adopted by early May, the appropriations process is delayed. Every week of delay further diminishes our ability to finish our work 
prior to the end of the fiscal year. In recent years, all too often, appropriations bills have been held hostage as members offered message amendments knowing that they would not pass, while the time needed to complete 12 freestanding bills slipped away. And by September, we, have, we had abandoned any hope of finishing all 12 bills as the calendar simply did not give us enough time. We Democrats must recognize that regular order cannot exist without bipartisan cooperation. Last year, despite the lack of a budget resolution, the committee completed almost all of its work preparing 11 of the 12 appropriation bills for floor consideration in a timely manner. However, gridlock on the Senate floor eliminated any further process. If a more open amendment process for relevant amendments will enable these bills to move forward, we should be open to such an approach, even if that means taking some uncomfortable votes. This chamber is split 53 to 47. Both sides need to give a little bit and in so doing, it is my hope that we can get the bipartisan appropriations process back on track. Certainly, no member of this body wants to explain to his or her constituents why we have failed, yet again, to responsibly fund the government or ceded our constitutional authority to the administration, or even why we were unable to work together responsibly to avoid disastrous government shutdown. Madam President, we must find a way to accomplish the task that the Constitution has assigned to us. To do this, we need a budget resolution. We need the House to send over appropriations bill in a timely fashion. We need floor time, and we need a willingness to vote on amendments. Without these four things, there is no doubt in my mind that I'll be standing in this chamber in late September yet again, seeking passage of a continuing resolution in order to avoid shutting down the government. Madam President, the House and the Senate need to find a way to work together to pass our bills under the regular order, to send them to the President. This is the only way we can restore discipline to the budget process. It is the only way we can maintain our constitutional responsibility to determine our taxpayers' dollars are spent. And, Madam President, it is truly the only way we can avoid repeating the catch-all spending bills that none of us want. I yield the floor. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Thank you.
Quorum call continues in the uh, U.S. Senate. Earlier today, they passed, uh, they voted to approve the nomination of Max Cugburn to be a, a judge for the Western District of North Carolina. That vote was 96 to nothing. Some comments earlier today by Majority, Majority Leader Reid on spending issues after the Senate yesterday failed to pass either the House passed bill, H.R. 1, or the Democratic alternative, and negotiations will continue off the floor as the Continuing resolution, the temporary spending bill ends a week from tomorrow. The Hill reports today that the um, that House Republicans are drafting a three-week measure that will cut another six billion dollars in spending. Over in the House today, they're working on a bill that would eliminate a federal home mortgage program. The Associated Press reporting that Republicans are ignoring a White House veto threat and pushing a bill through aimed at eliminating a program helped at aimed at uh, helping people refinance homes that are worth less than they paid for them. They'll take a vote shortly on that. In fact, that is uh, underway now, procedural votes underway now in the U.S. House. Also tomorrow, the House will take up a similar bill de dealing with mortgage support programs. The House live tomorrow beginning at 9 o'clock Eastern and House coverage on C-SPAN. You've been seeing on the screen, uh, we're promoting the uh, hearing later on this evening with Secretary Clinton, who testified today on the uh, secretary on the uh, state department budget she will be traveling to egypt and tunisia next week she will also meet with members of libya's opposition